Добри ден. Ако се мате? Добре. Но добре разумете и ако добре разумете, будем говорить лем по словенски. Добре. No, no, seriously, no. Okay, um, as you see here, uh, I live in Japan, and uh, I'm a professor of cross-cultural management. Oh, but let's, uh, this is oh, well. Let me go back to this and just explain. I'll try to make this presentation in about 20 to 25 minutes. If you've been to my previous presentations, which have been one hour over and things like that, this will be different today. Uh, in Greece, I was pretty much short. Uh, on time, um, because I want questions, okay? I want interactions. Basically, I just want to give you an idea of my journey and uh, give you some of the insights, reflections that I have, what I think. Okay, so, oh, I just turned it off? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I actually grew up uh, in the sunny state of Florida in a monolingual family. So how did I get to there? Okay, so basically what I, what I did here is I took the languages which I've had contact with, which I've uh, studied, spoke, listened to, wrote, and write, and the size of the letters is some, somewhat of an indication of how much time. Um, now, for example, actually Japanese is bigger than English, and uh, I'll explain as I go along, I left the United States in 1974, and I lived in many other places, which, okay, I'll leave that for later. Um, another thing is that when you look at the size and you think, okay, so how well do you speak that language? Well, for example, Slovak, uh, five hours in Slovak equals 50 days of studying Tibetan, okay? From my point of view, as a speaker of Polish and Russian and Serbian and Croatian, okay? And uh, for example, uh, one hour of studying Lao equals a uh, hundred hours of uh, Sherpa, okay? So, you know, once you have a lot of languages, I'm sure many of you know, then the cognate languages are, come very quickly. Okay, so what's the most important factor? I would say that it is passion, and not just for language, but also for culture. Now, when I was about six years old, I can remember listening to shortwave radio. It actually looked like this, okay? I was born in 1956, all right? So this is what, this is a radio from the early 60s. And I would just tune into all these different languages, and, you know, it was fantastic. It was like music to my ears. Of course, I didn't understand what they were saying. I just liked the melody. I wanted to know what they were saying. It was exotic. It was one of the main motivations that... Uh, has driven me. And I also, of course, very interested in the culture, uh, I would, let me say read, from a young age, actually I could read Ge National Geographic around age six or seven. Um, <clears throat> and what I thought, I, this, this thought that I wrote here, I'm not sure when I had it, but when I realized, I think it was maybe seven or eight years old, when I saw all these missionaries going everywhere, I said, don't change that culture! I want to see it, you know, in its original form. Um, okay, so uh, one point, I say you do not need to grow up in a multilingual family to become a polyglot. Actually, many people who speak three or four languages by circumstance, you know, depending on the uh, country they live in, it happens a lot in Europe and Africa and Asia, etc., they often don't bother to learn any other language. Okay, so uh, the next point is that there's the idea of the critical period hypothesis. If you don't learn a foreign language by a certain age, it will be da 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 da. Okay, but I say the barriers are social, psychological, and attitudinal in nature. But in this presentation, I don't want to get into all that literature and discussion. So if you want to see what I think about it, here are two papers, and I've gave, given presentations on this in, in Berlin and such. Okay, so you can take a look at them if you're interested. Okay, so. <clears throat> So listening to the radio, all these languages, and then when we moved to South Florida, I was surrounded by a lot of Cubans, so Cubano. So I started learning Spanish, and I learned to speak it muy rápido, así que lo cubano va a ser muy rápido, es difícil entender los otros personas. It's very hard for you to understand Cuban if, you, if uh, you've never experienced the speed and the pronunciation. Okay. Um, all right, Ooh, why does that come up now? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I wanted to talk about, 
Um, oh no, I'm going backwards, that's why. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> huh? Which way is... I'm holding it backwards. Yeah, Oh, okay, yeah, this is next one. All right, so since that time, since that time, I left the States at age 18. Um, I started university at 16, and I took a CLEP test, so I almost graduated from university at age 18. And it was too fast, and I just wanted to get out of the U.S. It was the end of the Vietnam War, 1974, and I left. And I just wanted to explore the world. And so... It seems it's 99, but when I threw this on Facebook, there was various interaction, which is a country or not, okay? I consider it's a better country. <laughs> All right, so whatever. So I'm still not at 100. Um, and uh, so I not just travel, but I went to universities in the United States, Colombia, Switzerland, Poland, Japan, Australia. Um, so I studied Slavic literature in Poland, Chinese literature in Japan. Um, Latin American literature in Colombia and Australia. I have a PhD in uh, cross-cultural management. And so I've worked in Germany, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Thailand. China, Taiwan, and Thailand is, was for teaching MBA courses, EMBA courses. Um, so by the way, I, I teach in Japanese as my main language of instruction, but also use, uh, I've, I've used Chinese, uh, Thai, uh, Vietnamese, uh, among some others. Okay, so here I go back to age 18. This is where I was in Bogota. And I started studying uh, Portuguese, French, and German in Spanish. So, points. Studying a foreign language, in a foreign language, one, helps you learn the language of instruction better, in this case Spanish. Uh, prevents translating into your mother tongue, rather I would think in Spanish, especially if it's cognate language, for studying Spanish in and uh, Portuguese and French. Uh, it's more stimulating, I think. And it naturally leads to a comparative perspective of vocabulary and grammar, especially when, co when they're cognate languages, okay? Oh, it's, so immediately you see, for example, in Portuguese that uh, the words are shorter, that you drop an I, okay? Or uh, how the pronunciation of the letter, especially in Brazilian Portuguese, you have to learn to say chi and ja, and many changes, like gente instead of gente. Uh, things like that. Okay, uh, now also the next point, somebody might see this and say, okay, well, can we study multiple languages at one time? I've seen this in, on the internet a lot, this question. And I heard Lydia's opinion. Now my opinion is not that far from there, but let me just go through it. First, it requires a lot of free time, okay? Um, it requires discipline uh, concerning how much time you allot to each language, where you're going with it. Um, and it's something you get better at with practice when you do it repeatedly over the years. So I've done it for 42 years now. And so for me, it's common to have a, at least two or three, if not four or five. For example, I learned Slovak uh, for this trip here. And so that took away uh, about five weeks from working on my uh, Tibetan and uh, Sherpa in Nepali for my next uh, trek in the Himalayas coming up in August. So you have to take a balance there, you know. Um, okay, so uh, what else? Yeah, it, it's just in, this is a, from a cognitive perspective. It, strengths, it strengthens your uh, executive function, such as working memory, perception, and attentional in inhibitory control. So inhibitory control means uh, preventing another language from influencing. If I'm speaking Portuguese, so I don't speak Portanol. Uh, if I speak in Laos, so I don't speak Thai. Things like that, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then also, uh, the next point is, when I was in Colombia, my first experience is I made a great effort to speak like a Colombian. Now, I don't look like an average Colombian. Everybody call me El Mono. <laughs> Not monkey, but Mono in Colombia, quiere decir ese. No? Rubio, si, sí, exactamente. And so I tried to, the thing was, what's was hard for me is because I was already speaking Cuban Spanish, so I had to change it to Colombian Spanish. And so, uh, and what happened is that really affected my accent in English. And ever since then, in all the languages I've been through, because I've, this, since that time, 18 till now, I've only been back in the States for about a total of three years, um, I struggle with 
language is affecting the way I speak English. I'm trying really hard right now to sound like an American. Um, I, am I doing okay? Yes, all right, yeah, all right. Um, but if when I go to India, you might, if I speak Hindi, but still listening to the English there, you know, right? <laughs> Daniel always does that, you know? Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, so, and I found this effect is between only foreign languages and English, never between other foreign languages. For example, um, I don't speak Chinese like a Polak, okay? <laughs> you know, so I, they, this, it's only, it, it's only I have this issue with my original identity, original linguistic cultural identity. And I, there's a number of reasons I could speak about it for hours. It's more of it's in the paper I, I wrote, but can you imagine if you're trying to sound like a native, then you really have to sort of sense, push aside, not totally reject, push aside the strongest uh, cultural linguistic identity you have. And then it's a struggle sometimes to bring it back. Okay. Uh, when you at a certain time. It's always, at, at, it depends on the situation. So uh, this is a paper where I talk about that. Okay, so I go into detail in this paper. Uh, I think this was the 90, uh, sorry, the, the first or second Berlin conference where I talked about this. Here's the paper. You can download it for free at uh, Academic EDU. Okay, so uh, how am I doing on time? How many minutes is that? No idea? Okay, because uh, I went in quickly, so figure out my speed. Uh, anyway, I took a six-month trip around South America, and I tried to learn all the local varieties of Spanish. The most interesting was Porteño, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard Porteño. Well, sentate, hablate conmigo. It's like Italian. And then Chilean, si, po, no, po. And uh, so I was trying to speak all of them that way and speak Brazilian Portuguese and reading the literature in every country. And this is what I fell in love with, all the works of Jorge Amado. Uh, I didn't read them all during the trip, but most of them afterwards. I couldn't carry this, this many books as a backpacker. And I fell in love with this music. Um, so, even though I, I went to Brazil again in 1994, no, 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 no 2000, I don't remember. Uh, anyhow, I've only been in Brazil a total of about three months, but my Brazilian Portuguese is, is pretty good. I mean, it comes, just say, it comes right back to me, but it's just because I read the books and listened to the music. I, you know, I haven't had that much time speaking it. Okay, so, so far as music, it's played a big role. Uh, I left out English here. So the size tells you what music I listen to most. Uh, and I really, Greek got cut off there. I love it, really love Greek music. And with the, I learned Greek before, the, not the conference that we had there last year, but for a cross-cultural psychology, psychology conference there in 2007. And then went back again in 2008 uh, to study for a month. Um, yeah, and I really love Brazilian Thai music. I spent many, many hours Thai and Chinese, etc. Okay, so uh, getting back to my journey, the next was a Ken uh, program at Kent State University in uh, Geneva, and where I studied international relations in French, and I took many trips around Europe and Scandinavia. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to insult anybody here, so please don't take this wrong way. But it's the first time I felt a conflict in relation to the feelings I have towards the language I speak. Because many people said, I got, oh, how beautiful French is, but I prefer Brazilian Portuguese, Spanish and Italian, and French down there, okay? Well, it's my personal preference. Um, I found that imitating the facial expressions and body language helps you speak more like a native speaker. I've noticed this not just with myself, but with other people. And it also gives the impression that you speak the language better because communication is not just the words you're saying. Okay, but this is a problem. I don't feel comfortably, I know all you, excuse me, I don't mean to insulting the French people. I know you all don't look like this when you talk, but it's part of it, right? Okay, so I don't feel comfortable with it, even though I did my studies in French and, you know, okay. Yeah. Just bye. Oh, you want to take a picture of that one? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, okay, don't shoot me any French people. <laughs> okay, so. Um, what about Slavic languages? Actually, my adventure began in Bolivia when I was traveling around. I met a girl from Slovenia, Sonia, and I kept asking her how to say all these things in Slovene. But when I, after being in Switzerland, I took a bicycle trip for the summer through Yugoslavia, and I quickly realized it's better to learn Serbo-Croatian. Okay, um, 
So I also, uh, in my, during these years, uh, I set a lot of uh, large and small goals. So the large goal, as you can see, was to speak all the major languages of the world, which I defined as 50 million speakers. But the problem is population has grown a lot since the uh, mid-70s, so it becomes more challenging. And also, I got caught up in many much smaller languages along the way. Um, so then I returned to Florida to graduate, but I actually had 240 credits to graduate because I studied elsewhere. Uh, you only need 120, but I had to be there to graduate for a couple semesters. So I went to Russian, Polish, Arabic, German, French, and I played uh, soccer with the Iranians and learned some Farsi. And then I took a driving tour of Poland, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus and got to more expose those languages. That's, that's what I looked like at that age. Um, yeah, it just keeps getting worse. Okay, then uh, two years at Adam Miskevich. It was just great. I had intensive courses in Polish. Then I rode around Eastern Europe and North Africa on a, on a Czech bike, Czech, you know, the uh, Java, the 350, which I bought in Poland new for $300 in 1979. And I spent another $50 buying all, all the parts for it in case something broke. Okay, uh, there I also studied uh, Japanese and Norwegian. Uh, in the summertime, I would work in Germany, uh, Wendelstein and Kleinstadt by Nuremberg, and then went to Norway. Okay, learning conditions for learning Polish were fantastic. No TV, no internet, no mobile phones back then. You all you needed some bread, smallets, <laughs> and vodka, yeah? And so Poles loved to philosophize. You know, they, especially, you know, age, age 19, 20, 21, 22, they'll spend hours and hours telling you about their views on everything in the world. Back then, I don't know now, but back then it was beautiful. Um, and, then, and then I went through Thailand, Southeast Asia, and wound up in Japan. And then I studied uh, China, uh, Chinese literature in, in, in Japan. Why in Japan? Well, one, I could earn a lot more money there. Also, two, kill two birds with one stone, studying Japanese and Chinese at the same time. The thing is, I ran into three different uh, ways of writing because I was uh, studying mainly uh, an author from the Cultural Revolution period, mainly written in simplified characters, but I first learned Chinese and traditional characters, and I had to use Japanese characters. Um, <clears throat> okay, then the next thing is then uh, I left there in 1986, and I took a trip around the world. I worked as an uh, um, market development manager at a U.S. firm in Tokyo. Then I was a corporate manager in GE for three years. Um, I, it was interesting, but I needed more, more than two weeks vacation a year. It doesn't matter how much they pay me. It wasn't worth it. Um, so last 26 years, I've been teaching management in Japan. And um, I basically have to go to the university and teach less than 100 days a year. So that leaves 256 days to travel and to study, et cetera. So as I said, if you're going to study a lot of, if you're going to study a, a number of languages one time, you need a lot of time, okay? Um, so uh, also my another point would be take advantage of every opportunity. For example, I learned Greek, spent 500, 500 hours learning Greek before uh, going to this conference, as I mentioned, and offer Af Afrikaans. I love Afrikaans, and I listen to a lot of Afrikaans music, too. Um, and some Zulu. And, oh, 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 my mouth is too dry. Can I have a drink? Okay. So, <clears throat> um, and then I want to wind up with what uh, Nelson Mandela said. Uh, Nelson Mandela raz powiedział, uh, kiedy przechowujecie ku człowieku uh, jazykiem, któremu rozumie, uh, chowujecie ku jego chlawie. Kiedy przechowujecie ku niemu jego własnym jazykiem, chowujecie z jego sercem. Same thing there. Okay? I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. One more. One more. Um, yeah, and then I, besides the major language, recently I've really been getting into Nepali. If you, if we're Facebook friends, you see a lot from Everest last year, Lantang this year. I'm going to do 33 days in some restricted areas between Anupurna and Lantang. And the uh, main language, was not Pali, is the lingua franca, but mainly Sherpa. And I spent uh, uh, two, uh, 10 days trekking in Lantang where the locals freaked out when I spoke to them in Tamang. 
So I was, it was funny, I went into, I went into uh, we were at a restaurant, my wife was with me, a restaurant, we were, okay, we were at a place you eat, <laughs> and uh, Nepali's there, the, the guides, and, and I was talking to the locals in Tamang, and then the ones that didn't know it in, in Nepali, and they just went, you know, they asked me, why, how, how do you speak like that? And I said, yeah, I just study. Actually, I have a student. It's very hard to study Tamang if you don't have a ref, uh, 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 various sources. And I have 20, uh, about 26 now seminar students from Nepal. And one girl whose name is Gurung <laughs> is a native speaker of Tamang, while a number of my students whose name is Tamang don't speak Tamang very well. Okay. Now, in her case, her father was in the Indian Army, and the Indians don't consider Tamang a strong name. Gurung, yes, like the Gorkas, and so he had to change his name. Okay, I think that, ah, yeah, Otaski, Mate Niyake Otaski. The very first slide? Yeah, yeah, the very first one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> could you, could you do that? Okay, while I'm, while I'm doing that, uh, how many minutes do I have? How do I do? So we have 22 minutes for questions. Uh, no, yeah. I meant the one with all the languages. Sorry. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can test me on all of them. <laughs> you see, I, I only. Hovorim lempo slovenski, in the Yazik ne muvim. Teraz mi sme na slovensko i treba muvis po slovenski. Hovoris po slovenski. Let my Polish hit my Slovak now. Okay, so actually, I hope you have questions because my intent was. Well, there are questions. Gracias. ¿Cómo, cómo, lo que a mí me interesa es cómo administras tus lenguas. ¿Tienes, tienes una lista uh, hoy portugués, mañana español, después inglés? ¿Cómo las administras? ¿Pero qué quieres preguntar? Como para todos los días, yo tengo una lista que voy a estudiar. Sí. No, no lo hago. <laughs> let, let me answer in English, okay? Let me answer in English, okay? So the thing is, the question is, you know, how do you keep all those languages alive? Well, okay. What I do is I try to go as far as I can in a certain language. The higher you get, the less effort you have to put in to bring it back later, obviously, right? Okay, so... Um, so, for example, I studied Slovak, you know, for five weeks before I came here. Now, I'm working with Polish, Russian, Serbian, Croatian, and some Slovene, but that's 38 years ago. But sometimes it depends on my mental state. Sometimes I speak almost as well as I did when I used to live here, sometimes not. Sometimes you'll hear me speak a language very well, and then all of a sudden I'll just, and nothing comes. I don't know. I, it's how, I, I know my brain. I don't know other people's brain, but what I... I I tend to focus on the languages, languages that I'm going to use in the near future. So as I said, so now, okay, uh, I will listen to some Polish because, well, uh, I didn't want to listen too much because I want to concentrate on Slovak. And so, okay, so basically five weeks I just uh, studied Slovak. And, and then uh, I have to leave tomorrow. And the moment I get on the plane, I mean, maybe I have speaks in German in Vienna, but afterwards I'm just going to try to think in Nepali, Tamang, and Sherpa. So, you know, I, I, I may be bringing up languages to a certain level along the way, and yes, they atrophy, yeah? But uh, if you really want to bring it back, you still have that base. And, and the more you do it, your, 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 your brain changes as you uh, practice doing this, is what I'm saying, okay? If, you, know, you can argue, oh, it's so hard to study more than one language at a time. Well, yeah, it is. But what happens when you do it? You have a different cognitive structure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Thanks for a wonderful talk. I wanted to ask you how you balance your language learning and your interpersonal relationships. When did you have time to find a wife? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only that's only if you think language learning involves looking at a book, <laughs> right? I mean. Uh, and once you have a number of languages, especially the cognate languages, you learn more just by listening. 
So you, 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 you talk to people, and actually you learn a language much better when you have a close relationship in that language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, hey, it's like you, it's not that I don't have a life, it's just like, okay, I'm driving to school. What language, you know, it's a, it's a, it, I, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I have to drive about 50 minutes each way. So I choose, okay, what language am I listening to today? Do I listen to music in Nepali, or do I listen to uh, some of the lessons I have recorded in a certain language? You know, just, just like that. And so the actual time I'm sitting down studying the language is not that great. It's only, uh, even with Slovak, I think I, I just spent just three hours, two to three hours a day. And then I talked online uh, with people about uh, 20 times or five weeks. So it was quite intense doing that. But it's not, I mean, look, at, I, I'm teaching in Japanese. In my class, I have uh, Thai, Indonesian, Chinese, is, is from Sri Lanka, but I don't speak Sinhala, uh, Nepali, Tamang, uh, I said Chinese. Okay, I have eight or eight or nine different, so often during the day when I'm at school, you know, in my s seminar means you have a, s a small select group of students. I have very few Japanese students in my seminars. I have a total of 71 and only five are Japanese. The foreign students like to come to me. They know I know their language or love languages and they, they come to mine. And uh, yeah, so it's just using the language, I would say, and studying it. Thank you. Yeah. So I understand that when you start learning a new language from the same language family, you just like dig digging into really sh uh, shortly and start speaking to people, right? Now, what do you do when you start a completely new language family, if there are any left for you still? <laughs> Sherpa, Tamang, Gurung, uh, these are all related to Tibetan. Um, some are close, Sherpa is closer than Tamang. Uh, but my Tibetan is still a beginner, and it takes a long time to really... Tibetan is so different in so many ways. Well, to give you an example in grammar, when you ask a question to somebody, they have conjugation of verbs. But one conjugation is for I and we, and the other is for everything else, okay? But when you ask a question, uh, you wouldn't say, are you Tibetan? You would say, uh, am you Tibetan? The reason why is because they're very polite and they're, they're giving you the verb that you need to use, the conjugation you need to use in answering it. So it's interesting when you say, when you say to somebody, am I crazy? You don't say am, you say, you say, you say are you, are I crazy? Because the other person would say no, you are not, or yes, you are. So it has these, another thing in writing in Tibetan that uses, it hasn't changed the writing system over uh, about 1,500 years. So uh, Tashidile has three, three basic uh, consonants at the beginning. There's nine consonants written, you pronounce three. So you write consonants before and after, not pronounced, they change, the, they change how the consonant after it is pronounced, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite complicated. Um, it, well, if you learn to read and write Japanese, Chinese, then of course there's nothing else that difficult. But I would say next is Tibetan, and then maybe Thai, Lao, Devanagari is easy, et cetera. Uh, have you ever considered to put a limit to the number of languages you want to learn because just you're feeling that you're not going to be able to maintain all the previous one or you just don't care because you're just too curious? <laughs> no, I think I really addressed that because I really haven't forgotten completely any language. I can even say a tongue twister in Hungarian that I studied very, my Hungarian is very low level, um, but I love Hungary and I was single and Hungarian women are very nice and I learned some Hungarian. <laughs> and you know, I, I, yeah, I forget, but it's just, it's, it's, it's not, think about the word forget. What does it mean 
forget. Does that mean it's disappeared? Oh, wait a second. There are things you can't remember now. I say, oh, you know, maybe, uh, okay. So I'm 61 years old. You asked me what were you doing when you were five or seven or eight, you know? Okay, I don't know, but if I get Alzheimer's, I might be able to tell you. It hasn't disappeared. Okay? So it's uh, something I think we can experience. I don't know how. I don't can't tell you a method or anything. But for me, I lose access to a language that I spoke yesterday momentarily, anytime, depending on what I'm doing. Especially at a polyglot conference, if I change to 5, 10, 15 languages, then I might lose the language I was just thinking in for momentarily. Okay, what I remember, really good, good example was when I, was when I moved from Poland to Japan, I was watching uh, a movie in Polish uh, with a Japanese friend and just really getting into it. Okay, I'd been in Japan for around six months and my, I studied it in Poland and my Japanese was quite fluent. And after the movie, then I turned around to her and I made a comment in Polish and she would, and I realized I was speaking Polish. And so, okay, I have to say it in Japanese. Zero. And then I said, okay, how do I bring it out? Look at, look at an object, table. Ah, Nihongo, table. Ah, no, that doesn't work, damn, things too close. TV, ah, TV. Oh, no, damn it. And then finally, she said something. She just gone, and finally she said something. When she said something, I could speak Japanese. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think we should be observant of how our brain works, and everyone, there's, there's, there are similarities, but everyone's unique. And people use different memorization techniques. I don't use any um, that I know of. I can't define it. I don't, I'm not a follower, so I generally try to make my own, learn from others and be eclectic and put something new together. You choose. Okay, okay first of all, thank you for this uh, class. Uh, I have one question for you. I noticed that you visited so many countries and uh, my question regarding to this is how do you manage uh, to travel, to visit all of these places and so on and to learn the language at the same time? No, 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 not financially, but uh, to, to learn, I mean with all of these books or something like that, to learn how to speak and so on. Um, it, it's, again, it, it's an ambiguous question in a sense because you're not saying which language. Well, it's totally different. I mean, Slovak, as I say, in Slovak, okay, I quickly read through, uh, uh, you know, the, what was the colloquial Slovak, but the problem is I could listen to the CD for the last lesson and understand it. Okay. I could understand it. I, they, there's a number of people sent me these CDs. I could go to the advanced level. And there are a few words I couldn't catch, but I figured them out from the situation. So, you know, So the active knowledge of a language is a lot more difficult than the passive knowledge. So there's one totally different answer for a cognate language. So, um, so you're saying, let me see, uh, how do you travel to so many places? And oh, I had a lot more time when I was younger. I was a vagabond until about age 31. Well, various universities, okay, I three masters and PhD. I mean, I was doing something. But mainly the thing was, yeah, if you're a student, you get discounts and you can get a visa for a country like Poland and live there when it was a socialist country and things like that, you know? In Japan, if you're a student, you can work 28 hours a week and make a lot of money back then when there were many native speakers. Uh, I, when I first was, maybe the tax people were not listening. Um, when I was a student in, in, from 1981 in, in Japan, I would make the equivalent of about 6,000 euros a month, and that was a lot of money back then. Yeah. Yeah. So that paid for a lot of my travels. And other travels I did, uh, you know, on the cheap, really on the cheap, you know. Uh, $900 from Colombia down the Amazon all the way to the end of Tierra de Fuego on a boat up to Puerto Montt back to Colombia, $900, okay, 1976. Uh, I think he was first, so can we get that? Well, 
It appears that you should be in an ideal position uh, to do scientific work in fields like comparative linguistics or even tackle very basic questions such as the structure of language, in, such as Noam Chomsky did in his early years and so on. No? Is it something which is within your scope or which you are actually interested in? Or is it... But you mentioned Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky is a monolingual. And that's one of the problems with uh, his universal grammar and the way he looked at it. He thought you could understand the key to all languages by studying just English. It stayed in his book in, uh, I think it was 1966, okay? So if you look at it, I've written a lot about this. I don't want to go into about universal grammar and all that kind of stuff. Yes, actually, I think because of this experience, it's easy. And, I, and I've read... Uh, literally more than a thousand papers in, in the cognitive linguistics and applied linguistics, et cetera, and I've read all what Noam Chomsky wrote on and on and on. And again, what I studied was Latin American literature, Slavic literature, Chinese literature, and then I have a, a, another degree in international uh, business in the United States and a PhD, okay? Uh, in, so I've done mainly languages, but you can't make a lot of money that way. And that's why I thought. So I wanted to make money so I have free time, you know? And then GE, I made a lot of money, but I didn't have free time, so I quit. And now I do fine, and I have more time. Um, but your question was about that field and everything. Yeah, I'm extremely interested in it. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that there are so many monolingual linguists in the world. If you're, uh, if you're a native speaker of English, you can be a monolingual linguist. If you are not and you want to be published, you have to at least learn English. Okay? Yeah. Next. Thank you for the, for the talk, Professor Keeley. Um, I would just like to ask one short question. You mentioned on this slide that we have up here, you say study, studying, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Do you really divide up tasks between those different, uh, different groups of activities, or do you prefer to look at this in a more holistic, as a more holistic approach? Okay, so. <clears throat> the title is Making of a Hyperglot, and I hate the numbers game, okay? So I don't want to talk about how many you have to speak to be a polyglot, how many you have to speak to a hyperglot. For me, it's attitude, okay, and such, and the way you approach things. And so I said, okay, now, how am I going to talk about the languages that I've dealt with until now, and how am I going to get across, you know, how many do you really speak, and do you speak them this well, and do you know every idiom in the language? You know, this whole numbers game just drives me crazy, okay? so. Basically, I said, okay, let me do it this way. I'll just think of how much time I spent studying, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. I left out thinking, because I think in English if I'm not involved in another language. So obviously, you know, that's a, if, I'm, if I'm teaching in Japanese, of course, I'm thinking in Japanese. And that usually hangs over for the next 10 minutes, five minutes sometimes. So like if I teach about economics in, in, in Japanese and you, you ask me questions about it in English, I search for the term that I just said in Japanese, you know. So they, I go into different realms and, you know, come back in and out like that. What was your question? <laughs> oh, about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I go off on a tangent, you know. Okay. This is what happens with age, you know, your mind just, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, well, you were asking about how you divide it up and everything. But my answer comes from, you know, how do you, how do you talk about how many languages you speak? And, 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 and I, didn't, I don't really care for any tests or anything, like this B, C level, I don't even know the details of it. And also I had a friend who, a Slovak friend who speaks fantastic German, was, who was helping me with uh, in Slovak in these last couple of weeks you know, online. He said, look, I know so-and-so, she just got a C2, she's got a C2 in German, I have a C50. So I don't, you know, you study for a test. And I don't, I'm not into that. So I said, this, just, this is just the way that I figure I, I, you know, that I would just say, look, I spent this much time studying these languages comparatively, okay, and speaking them, and so, um, but as I said, you know, the ability of the language depends on whether or not I have a strong language that's, a, that's an anchor language, you know, and, and, and helps with all the other cognates. Because I, okay, Spanish speakers, Portuguese speakers, can you understand Catalan immediately? French speakers, yes? Catala, you can immediately, right? Gallego, yeah, okay. All right, if you spoke Thai, you understand Laos, you speak Indonesian, you definitely get by in Malay. I mean, there are certain cases, you know. Um, you speak Hindi, you can understand Pali somewhat. 
Yeah, you know, things like that. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is regarding identities. You touched upon your national identity, and I can completely relate to what you said, but I'm interested more also in a professional identity because you're a business or management professor, but obviously are very interested in languages as well. So how do you, or what do you consider yourself to be? Do you consider yourself to be a business professor or a linguist or a traveler? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, good answer, I thank you. You know, yeah, I don't. I can play the role of professor, I can play the role of backpacker, I can play the role of surfer, mountain climber, whatever. Yeah, no, I don't care about. I mean, it's good. I do care about, you know, the only degree because it gets me a job, and, and if I, you know, have certain papers out there, and, and you know, when I, if, if, if I can say, for example, here, uh, where, on, yeah. Okay, so I say, look, um, top 1% in the world in number of views in this at that certain time of that month. So I'll say, I'll say to you know the university, yes, I have to go to this conference because look, the results are very good. All these people are, are looking at my paper, and then they say, okay, you have to put up a lot with a lot of BS when you're, you know. So you, you have to make yourself look like a certain thing, you know, put it out there. But I, it's not important to me. Mine's easy. Uh, out of all the countries you've been to, which one did you enjoy going to the most? I know it's probably, I, I know, but on a scale, but like which one would you go to, where, where would you go back to if you? you know, that really depends on your age. Now, at age 19, I love Brazil, yeah. You know, and also later, you know, like in the early 20s, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know, there's so many, Right now, which do I go back to? I go back to the Nepal, Nepal, Nepal. I fell in love with the Himalayas and, and India and Sikkim and Darjeeling and Ladakh and uh, uh, Uttarakhand and the Tibet and that whole area. Because now, okay, when you figured you've had enough of the major languages, you get more fun from the minor ones. <laughs> you know, think about it. Well, people, read, oh, one minute. Okay, so um, can I end up with this explanation? It's okay. No more questions. So for me, you know, the reward from speaking a language, you know, there, there are many rewards, but one is the kind of relationship that you establish when you speak somebody's language, how much they appreciate that you reach out. People don't appreciate that much if you speak German or French or Spanish or some, yeah, okay. When you speak Tamang and Sherpa and things like that. And Nepali, in Nepali when I was trekking, like in the Purna region, so uh, I was doing rainy season, there were not that many people trekking, and I'd meet the uh, Nepalese along the way with their porter or whatever for somebody else. I trek alone, no guide. And I'd talk to them, and then when I got to the next village, they'd say, oh, you're that guy who speaks Nepali. <laughs> <laughs> and it was even more so, uh, you know, Tamang, the porters, they would, they would the porters, uh, oh, it's Sherpa, when I was going up to Everest, when I trekked up to Everest in, in last August. So, you know, all these other groups, a lot of porters, and I'd sit around, I, I, would, I would only talk to the porters, you know, mainly, you know, uh, you know at the ho hanging out at the hotel and such. And so, um, they would meet other porters and say, hey, this guy speaks Sherpa. And then they'd come up to me and then, you know, say, <laughs> they, they'd really try to see, you know, they speak some Sherpa with me, you know. Kerang Kamang, Kanihin, I said, oh yeah, I'm in Japan. And so we start, they, they were curious, they, just couldn't, they never met anybody. Usually, don't meet any people who don't look like a Nepali who speak Nepali. And they have a Hindi, Hindi speaking people who try to speak Nepali at times when they're there. Yeah. So that's where the reward, this is a reward from uh, the Automatiske Svenika Medzinami Puto. Resumish. Dobre.